All right, good evening. Welcome to Grace Baptist Church this Thursday evening. We're back at Thursday evening services. And uh, we um, have had a little bit of sickness float through, but everybody is well, and it's exciting to be back. And so, if you would turn in your Bibles to first. Corinthians, or sorry, First Chronicles. Turn in your Bibles. I'm not gonna, we're not gonna do a sword drill. But if you turn in your Bibles to First Corinthians, or sorry, First Chronicles, First Chronicles, Old Testament, uh, 16 and verse 25. I want to look at something very, very important. There is something else that's very, very important about this particular lesson, and it's this. This is the last lesson of our God, what is God like series? What is God like? Question mark. And we've learned a lot of things about God so far. And, and we've shown that God is almighty, that he's alpha and omega. He's awesome, compassionate, deliver, exalted, faithful. He forgives, he's glorious, he's good, gracious, guides. He heals, he's holy. He's our hope, he's Emmanuel, that is God with us. He's the just judge. He's the king of kings and lord of lords, the lamb without blemish he is love he is majestic merciful omnipotent omnipresent omniscient he is the one god he protects he's righteous and stephen what did righteous mean what did righteous what did we learn righteous meant tonight righteous righteousness God's, yeah, God's standards. Uh, we have a righteousness in this world that is not based on God's standards, but it's based on man's standards. But true righteousness is based on God's standards. We look that we learn that He's our rock, that He's our sacrifice, that He saves, that He is the great shepherd, that He's our shield, and that He's sovereign, that He is the one mediator, that He's trustworthy, that He's truth, that He's unchangeable, that He is wise, that He is with us. And tonight we are going to learn that he is worthy. So I want to take just this moment. We're going to read the word of God uh, plainly here. And uh, we're going to just read one verse. And then we're going to pray and get right uh, into it. First uh, Chronicles chapter number 16. 16 and verse number 25. The Bible says this, declare his glory, uh, th sorry, verse 26, for all the, notice the little g, gods of the people are idols, but the Lord hath made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence, strength and gladness are in his place. Given to the Lord, ye kindreds of the people, given to the Lord, glory and strength, and I want you to Highlight this next thought. Uh, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The Bible says uh, there in verse number 25, we read it. For great is the Lord and great to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. And I would say this, he is worthy Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd help my thoughts, help uh, me to be able to explain the thought that you are deserving of everything. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you ever had a tussle? Maybe there was one last thing left. Maybe it was the last piece of cake. And, uh, and, you think, and you think to yourself, and sometimes children, they'll get into a little conversation about that last piece of cake. Everybody's had a piece of cake, and so there's just one piece left. And so everyone will begin to uh, proclaim his own righteousness. Well, I did the most, uh, I helped mom the most today, or I 
had the best grades in school, or I did this, or I did that. And so they'll try to come up and they'll try to uh, prove that they are worthy of that last uh, thing. In our life, we often will try to strive to be worthy of someone's acceptance. I know a lot of people, even to this day, that are adults, are trying to be worthy of their mother and father's uh, praise or acceptance. And can I tell you uh, that, that we ought to try to strive to be acceptable uh, in God's sight, but nothing truly makes us worthy apart from the work of God. Uh, but what does that word worthy means? When we think of the word uh, worthy, uh, uh, can you think of a word that is hidden in that word worthy? Anybody out there? Yes? Worth. And so what does the word worth means? Worth means value or uh, have you ever heard worthwhile? What does it mean? It's worth or there is value in something that is worthwhile. It means there's some, there is value in doing it. And so when we say we are worthy, uh, sometimes we think of it as deserving but really, when we say that God is worthy, it means he is so valuable for the things that he's done. He's so valuable for the fact that he created all of uh, this world. He's so valuable because he is the sustainer of the creation. He's so valuable because he is truly uh, the, the, worth, the, uh, the priceless, not worthless, the priceless sacrifice uh, who is worthy. The word worthy tells us uh, something about worth, or value. So when we say that God is worthy, we are saying that he is of great value or that he alone deserves our respect, our honor, uh, the things that we can give unto him. And uh, uh, as we go through and we've looked at Israel, we've looked at uh, Israel as they were slaves in Israel's past, God rescued his people uh, from uh, slavery in Egypt and he led them through the desert for 40 years and God would teach his people, how that they were supposed to worship him. He would give him the tabernacle and they would, he would give them the, uh, all the different symbols and the sacrifices. He would give them uh, the Levites and uh, the people. And part of his instructions on worship included building the tabernacle where God would dwell. And uh, they would put the, the priests would go in once a year. They would have the Holy of Holies. They would have the Ark uh, of the Covenant. And the ark had a, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, the best way we can describe it is a wooden box that was overlaid uh, with gold. Inside the ark were the Ten Commandments and Aaron's staff and the manna uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and there was the, uh, the different things that reminded Israel so that they would never forget about the things that God would do for them. And there would be the laws and there would be uh, special ways of moving the ark. And after 40 years, God would lead his children into the promised land and they would go into battle with the Philistines and they would take this ark with them uh, as a good luck charm. You say, what is a good luck charm? It's a little thing of, well, I hope that by carrying this little thing with me that I'm going to do a little bit better. And if we aren't careful, instead of understanding that God is worthy, He is worthy of our free time, He is worthy of our thinking, He is worthy of everything, we begin to think that we are worthy. And so God goes from being worth everything and, worth and worthy of everything that we can give Him uh, to being a little gold luck, a little, uh, sorry, a rabbit's foot or a good luck charm. And Israel, instead of realizing that God was worthy of everything, they begin in time uh, to take lightly the things and the ark would be captured. And the Philistines would put the ark in the temple of their god, Dagon. You know what God would say? God would say, you're a little G-God. And like we read tonight, the Bible says this, Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all gods. Understand the Philistines feared Dagon. He was their God, their, if you will, good luck charm. And God had to show that Dagon was not worthy of people's worship. And so what would happen? 
they would put the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Dagon and they would come back in the morning and you know what they would find? They would find Dagon bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. They would find Dagon's statue, if you will, the image of Dagon uh, falling over. And so in time, we all know the story and we've, we've worked through it about how the Ark would find its way back. And a man would have to lose his life because he didn't understand that God was worthy of our obedience. And he was worthy of being followed step by step. And so they would bring the ark and they would finally get it settled and they would sacrifice just the wagon, the cart that the, uh, that the ark of the covenant came in and the animals that would draw it. And Samuel commanded the people that they do what? That they put away the, the false gods. Can I tell you that in the United States of America, and this isn't going to be a long preachy message, but we're starting to elevate things really to the point of godhood. I think in many ways, this last uh, week, and in the last couple days, we've seen people elevate a man who is certainly worthy of our respect because of his office, and they have elevated him way higher and if you will, they are giving him worth above what he is worthy. We've seen people on the other side of the political spectrum that are beginning to uh, take power and, and they're beginning to believe that their power is worth so much or is of so much value. But can I tell you, at the end of the day, no matter who sits as president in the White House, no matter who sits as uh, governor in Olympia, Jesus said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He said that in John chapter 16. He said, he said these things have I spoken unto you uh, that you might uh, have peace. It's either peace or joy. Let's turn there, John uh, 16. John 16, verse 33, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And when we get to Revelation, when we get to the very end, you know what we see over and over and over and over and over? We see, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and he is worthy. He is worthy to receive honor and uh, glory and power and riches and all these things. What does that mean? It means we can give our riches and we can give our attention and we can give our time and our talent and our treasure and our efforts over to a worldly system. And what are we really saying? We're saying, you know what? I want this worldly system to go forward or I want this thing that I'm backing to be successful. You know what Jesus says? In the world you shall have, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's like this. It's like when two guys are sitting at a table and they're arm wrestling. And they're giving it their all. Only one person is going to win. You don't have a draw in arm wrestling. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, I have overcome the world. It means no matter how much, uh, if you will, the political parties put into trying to make this world system prevail. No matter how much the economic uh, devices in this world try to make this world succeed, Jesus says, nope, eventually I have overcome the world. You know what that means when it, when it says that Jesus has overcome the world? It means this world system is going to lose. And how many people move off to the, a city called Hollywood, California or New York City and they think to themselves I'm going to a place that is worthy of my talents, worthy of my treasures. I'm going to devote my life to make it in the stock market or make it in Hollywood or make it on Broadway and I'm going to make my mark and I'm going to make my change in this world and I'm going to make a difference and people are going to know me. And Jesus says, be of good cheer. Why? 
I have overcome the world. I've overcome. You say, I don't see Jesus overcoming Hollywood right now. And I don't see Jesus overcoming Washington, D.C. right now. And I don't see Jesus overcoming the, the stock market system and the world economy system that is falling apart. Can I tell you? We read the end of the book and it says he's worthy. Why? Because in the end, Jesus overcomes all of these different things. And we read in Revelation chapter 21 about a, a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because he was worthy to, to, to open the book and, to, and he was the worthy sacrifice. And then he's worthy or he's valuable in this new, making the new world and making the new heaven and making, what he said, all things new. He alone is worthy. The idea when it says that Jesus is worthy, that God is worthy, is not that he is worthy in comparison or has value in comparison to other things. It's not like so-and-so is this valuable and Jesus is this valuable. So-and-so is this valuable and Jesus is this much more valuable. The idea is just like Jesus is all powerful. God is all powerful. What does that mean? It means all power resides in God and without God, anything that has power does not have power. And just like all power is given to Jesus and so any power that I have is because of Jesus, all, if we, when we say this, he is worthy, we're not saying he is worth more than you, we are saying he is worth everything and any value that I have in my life is because of who? Jesus. Any value that I had in my life even before I was born again is because of God, because he created me and he created the world that I got to uh, live in. And he created the air that I breathe. He created, he, you get the idea when the Bible says that he is worthy it's not again it's not saying he's worth more than us it's saying he's worth everything when we get that perspective we begin to look at our life and we wonder how could god want any how could god want a life as worthless as mine when i compare my worth or my value to god how could god want some how could god even value something like me and again, the only answer I can give you is that the value that I have is because I'm a specific creation of Almighty God who's worth everything. Any value that I have in my life is because of Him. All power is given into Him in heaven and in earth. All value belongs to Him in heaven and in earth. And anything that I have in my life is because of Him. He is worthy. Father, I'm so grateful that he was worthy to open the book, that he was worthy to uh, die on the cross, that, he, that, that you're worthy. You're all powerful, all worth, all value. Nothing, Father, in our life can we say there's nowhere in an area of our life where we can say, God, you owe me anything. Father, we of ourselves have no value except for the value that Christ places in our life. And that was so great. Help us, Father. Help us to live in light of the fact that we are worth nothing and you are worth everything. In our life, in our plans, in our dreams, Father, apart from your will, are worthless. We ask these things in Jesus' name.